and I'm particularly excited that you're here tonight when our Dean, Dean Jali Mung, is here, um, and he very generously came up with the idea for this discussion. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the circumstances of how that arose. So last spring, when I was appointed director of the Center for Writing and Communicating Ideas, um, I, we had a conversation, and we were talking, unsurprisingly, about writing and communications. Over some really good wine. Yes, <laughs> over some very good wine, yes, when Rialto still existed, yes. And um, we both came up with the idea that I would read uh, some, some of his, Dean Monk's writings. So I was expecting something like this. <laughs> um, this paper, for those of you who'd like to read it, is called To Center or Not to Center? That is Not the Question, an Ancillarity Sufficiency Interweaving Strategy ACES for Boosting MCMC Efficiency. So we, we will not be discussing this paper tonight, but I just want to call your attention to it because it's actually extremely well structured. And I just want to just say a few things because one of the things that I'd like to talk about this evening is the difference between modes of writing that we consider to be formal and official and modes of writing that we consider to be uh, humorous or, you know, blogs or, and is there something in between academic writing and informal writing? And my own view is that the emergence of blogs by so many academics is really the beginning of a, a new genre. Um, and my suspicion is that because blogs are more fun to read than articles, that things will uh, trend heavily in that direction. Um, having said that, I just want to suggest a little comparative lens between uh, writing that is deemed to be formally academic and the writing that each of you um, has in your lap, which is part of uh, Dean Mung's blog series, which is hilarious and amazing reading, and is basically like laugh out loud funny and makes you want to take statistics mm -hmm. classes. <laughs> um, so it's called the XL Files, um, and you, you can all find it, and there are a lot of them. And they're basically all funny and wonderful. And the statistics is woven into them in such a way that it seems like this beautiful, multifaceted lens through which to view humor. And it made me look up the word stochastic. And I now know what it means. <laughs> I'm sure you all know that word. Right? <laughs> um, so in, in looking at this paper, which, which none of you have, I, uh, I just want to uh, mention a few features of it. Um, this sentence begins with what I call a, a functional definition. And a functional definition is just when you're defining what something does in giving an initial description of it. And then it indicates what much literature on this topic has to say. And then it sets forth uh, this objective of finding a more efficient way to do something to the MCMC. Um, that's my technical explanation of it. And uh, with this interweaving. Um, and this math, which I will not try to explain, does this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, by page three of this paper, uh, and you'll notice that the, the title obviously is drawn from Shakespeare's Hamlet. So you can see that there's a certain amount of wit being used here. And then even the section headings are sort of uh, witty and nicely put. So coupling is more promising than compromising. That's true, and it sounds very deep. Um, <laughs> uh, and it is. Yeah. Um, and then. They really describe for us what the motivating problem of this paper is. And that's something I really would like us all to think about and thinking about different modes of writing, which is that you're never just writing about a topic. You're always addressing a problem. 
and that there's a fit between the approach that you're taking and the problem that you've learned how to identify. And it's actually harder to identify problems than you might think. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we tend to focus very heavily, I think, on problem solving and uh, problem recognizing um, and problem defining are the two essential pieces of work that should precede problem attacking and ideally problem solving. So with that said, I want to turn to the Excel files. Um, what this represents, this is just a few pages. Uh, I, I picked two of the Excel files, two of my favorites. Um, and these are some of the comments that I made. Um, and we're just going to have a conversation about writing and communicating and intellectual life and wine and humor and being a dean, I don't know. <laughs> That's the least part I want to talk about. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so these, these are actually very good reading. I want to emphasize this. When you were first asked to write these Excel files, were you thinking, I want to make them entertaining, or we're using them as a teaching vehicle. What was your imagination? Sure, but let me, before I answer mm -hmm. her question, I want to just first welcome all of you, and I can assure the, you that since you're attending this uh, five chat, five side chat tonight, you will graduate sooner. Okay, so that's. <laughs> okay, you will be writing better. You'll be, Thinking better, let's hope that way. Uh, but seriously, I really want to thank Suzanne for taking on this, uh, you know, founding director of the Center for Writing and Communicating Ideas. It's a, it's a new initiative at the graduate school, something we wanted to do for a long time. And Suzanne actually has been the writing tutors for all these years, single-handedly helping so many students. But was, I'm so glad that we've, we have a formal mechanism now doing this. Then we have more than Suzanne. We have. Dan and others, you know, I haven't met, and uh, uh, that will be uh, really helping all of you. So, absolutely take advantage of the existing of the center. I think what we're trying to convey tonight, if I convey anything, is writing is not just about the writing. Writing is about organizing your thought. It's about communicating. It's about how you achieve better scholarship. And I'm going to just tell you all those sort of my personal experience. But I have to tell you one big difference. Suzanne, she is professionally trained to do all those things, so she can comment on things that I have no idea what I've done. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I write, I wrote, of, you know, it's more because I enjoy writing. I'll tell you why I enjoy writing. It's sort of just my, I'm amateur, I'm, I'm very passionate, because it's, it's, I enjoy doing it. So she's going to put on all the series, why this works, this doesn't work, so. You, you will see the difference of, of between the professions and the, and the amateur. So let me, let me just tell you, uh, initially when I was invited by uh, this, um, this uh, uh, I should, how should I call it? It's like a magazine. It's uh -huh. not a journal. Uh -huh. It's the International Mathematical, wait, I already got it wrong. <laughs> my, my statistical students, you know IMS, is Institute, oh. Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Oh. It's, uh, they have this uh, sort of gluten, you know, the, the monthly. They have been having variety of people you know, write these columns. So they're trying to make them more attractive, a better reading than just sort of announce events, you know, job announcements, so on and so forth. And this particular editor, for whatever reason, that he appreciated the way I write. So, so he, uh, you know, he contacted me and said, I enjoy your sort of witty way of writing. I, I did this for some reason, build a reputation in statistics. Uh, people can tell pretty much by the title whether this paper is written by me or not because <laughs> I, I usually I avoid trivial titles I just don't like them I I feel like the title is is like the first thing you attract you know audience sort of the readers attention so I always sit there I spend a long time my students know I want I have quite a few students in my mm -hmm. audience there uh, that, that uh, uh, they know that I would spend a lot of time to think about the titles so I'm very big on title I want to encourage you to think about titles so for whatever reason that I had that reputation, so he invited me and I said, sure. And I, I, I would have loved to have these opportunities. So what I thought about was, was I think it was both. I decided to write something uh, semi-humorous. -hu you know, partly is also because you know, statisticians 
I mean, in general, you don't think of statisticians are the funny bunch, right? <laughs> you know, they're, they're being viewed as the nerdy ones. They're, so, you know, when I, I remember one time I was visiting Hong Kong University and uh, they, for some reason, they need to examine my CV. And the mathematician was very surprised to, found, to find that the type of titles I have is, wow, the statistician write this way? I said, you know, it's good. Some statistician write this way. So I intended to have some kind of sort of a humor because I think a humor is always a great way to communicate. And uh, humor also gets you yourself out of trouble. Uh, you know, there are, there are many times that if I was, well, I was watching debate last night, I guess many of you watched watching <laughs> debate, I think there are a lot of things that you, either side can get themselves out of trouble, just have a little bit more humor. But unfortunately, I don't think they were doing that. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's a separate story. Um, but I did also try to really uh, convey not much the general education because I know that I'd be writing to statisticians. Mm -hmm. But this is, as you, as the, as the society title may suggest, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, these are the more theoretical statisticians. They're the one that does, you know, the statistics actually really have four big branches. By the way, I'm going to give you a little bit of statistical education <laughs> as well. From the sort of theoretical mathematical statistics to the methodological, to the computational, to the applied. So there are these varieties. What I intended is to write to this more sort of a theoretical, mathematical oriented the audience. The topics, I hope they will get them a little bit away from thinking too mathematical the, into the type of, I, I love the idea of thinking very philosophically, but that's different than mathematically. And I also want to bring the type of issues that um, just sort of happens these days in life. Everybody have, probably have heard about big data, right? It's all related to what we do. But then I also intended to have some kind of humor really convey to the audience that, um, to the readers that they can be a better educator, because most of them are faculties, by using a little bit of humor you know, you know, them, you know, themselves, right? So that's what sort of all those things. By the way, all those things was actually really not initially I really intended. I mean, I had some vague idea, but as I was writing more, that's how I usually develop my, my sort of ideas, I started to analyze my own writing or organizing my own thoughts, because for me, writing is an incredibly important process to organizing my, my own thoughts, own theory. And so, uh, so over the time, now I've written like 20 pieces mm -hmm. that uh, I realized what I've been doing, so now I can tell you a little bit more. So. Some of your pieces seem to me to be structured along distinctive narrative lines. Um, and one that I have noticed throughout the X-Files is that you identify a problem or a situation where you're experiencing some sense of limitation. And then the way that uh, this dynamism of the piece unfolds is that you're constantly either trying to move away from the problem or you're trying to find a new way into it. Um, but do you self-consciously put situations at the beginning like that? that you, could you see, that's the form of theory. Yeah. And I can tell you <laughs> what really happened in my way of thinking. Um, so initially, uh, if I would certainly appreciate you read the whole thing. because. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the very first piece I wrote, uh, I meant to tell lots of stories, meant to tell that statisticians actually play many different roles. So I wrote about how I'm going to write things from being, certainly being an educator, as an editor, being uh, even, uh, you know, even as a policeman, you may say why the police comes in, you will see why, why I wrote that. So I'm basically saying there are so many different roles statisticians actually play. So I want to sort of illustrate this sort of multifaceted sort of nature. But actually when I was doing it is like the way I write those things, I'm very much looking forward to write this. This is truly one of the things that I truly enjoy. Okay, you know, there are not too many things. I enjoy many things. <laughs> there, are, there, there, there are a few things I truly enjoy. I probably this is one of the most enjoyable thing because I usually will look forward to a weekend. I usually write this piece of pub probably take one day. But I'd be thinking a lot, right? I'd be driving. When I was, I was driving or I was jogging, that's the best time for me to 
thinking about the phrase, thinking about what's the storyline. So the way I write it is always, what will be the punchline? What will be the thing I want to tell a story? Well, what if like, people want to walk away, they'll be thinking, what I'm hoping, and I think you should also hope this, anytime you write a piece, no matter how small, how, how casual it is, or how serious it is, you hope that when the reader finishes the reading, they will be thinking, wow, there's something I haven't thought about. Now, that could be something very bizarre, very trivial, but you want to say something that, you know. So I always want to. So in my mind, I would be thinking, driving, jogging, I would be thinking about, OK, here's something I experienced just recently. Attend a conference, like the one, mm -hmm. or, or some, a course I taught. What would be a punchline in 800 words? That's also the beauty of writing this piece, because I was restricted to 800 words. There's only one piece I, I had to petition them that they give me two pages. That was the one that I did this uh, memory church uh, wedding oh, ceremony. Oh, that's in Victoria. That, that, yes. Yeah, that's a different story. That's I, an amazing I, I, piece. I had a long, uh, long, long speech. I <laughs> requested two pages. But everything else is essentially 800 words. It's actually very useful. I would suggest to yourself that when you write, that sometimes put yourself in this situation, you can only have that much space, right? You know writing shorter takes a lot longer time than writing longer, right? right? You know that famous, whoever said this, mm -hmm. I, I don't have enough time to write a short letter. That's right. right. And because it's, it's really a, it really takes a lot more time. But because of that, I was thinking very hard about in that space, what, want, what do I want to deliver? What's the punchline? And I typically, because I'm writing to a statistical audience, I would also think about, I want to deliver a line is statistically relevant. That's actually not that easy. I mean, I can tell lots of stories. So you see, I hope I've achieved this. And you know, my, my students from statistics, they can tell me, I, I try to deliver lines that either is related to statistical thinking, or it's related to statistical education, or re related to be a statistician. Like, you know, the rejection obviously is related to everyone, how to deal with the rejection. But it is something that my student might find that's useful. So usually the development is that at the very beginning, I have a theme. And I'd be taking literally, because you know, it's good that I only write every, initially it was eight times a year, and now it's four times a year. And I, and I really like, I actually don't like these daily blocks, because I know I would be terrible, because I would not be happy. And, uh, and I can't spell. My students know that. I would need to spell check. I do all sorts of things. I have all sorts of Chinglish. And I need the time to correct or iterate those things. So I like to take time. I have the theme that I, I, write, I write, take time. And I think it's very important. I want to encourage you to think about that as well. But I did take time to really think through all the themes. And often I will be in my mind, not putting on the words yet, in my mind actually with the revise, I will be rejecting myself. Then I will have one day. I will be sitting down and not knowing exactly how the story will take me. And that's the best part. And I've done so many times that I, the part I was most happy with myself is when I finished the piece, I realized the flow was better than I, than I initially started. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, initially sometimes I really struggle for a few days, I don't have a flow, but eventually when you write, your finger almost guides you toward these passes that you did not expect. And I absolutely love that process. And the, at the end of the day, you know how I celebrate a great glass of wine. <laughs> and I read again and again what I wrote myself. And I, that's another thing I say. You should always read what you write. Read 10 times. I'm not joking. I read everything I've written at least 10 times. After read it 10 times, you still feel there's a story to be told. You're not bored by your own writing. It's a time to send that out. I, I think that's exactly right. And during the 10 years that I was doing almost nothing but reading graduate student papers, um, I was often asked, is there one thing that you notice sort of across the board? And I said, yes, um, it's not directly related to writing. It's, in fact, related to reading. reading yeah. And the number one thing is that people don't read their own work enough. <laughs> um, and there are good reasons for not reading your work enough. I sometimes can't stand to look at my work. <laughs> um, having said that, if you can overcome the revulsion and actually dive into it, uh, the diving into it is actually where you make it beautiful. You have to immerse yourself in the mud if you want to find the diamonds. So it, it is a messy process. 
the process itself uh, should be allowed to be messy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and let me also say, the, when I was doing this reading, that I'd be thinking about ways to improve, right, obviously. And I will be playing a game with myself, which is for every single sentence, what is the shortest way of deliver the same mm -hmm. message? Mm. What's the parallel structure? You know, I, I have a little bit of Chinese writing training. We're very much talking about everything should be very elegant, everything should be full words, parallel, you know, you have the you have to have the rhyme. So I can't do that in English because that's not my native language. I even even when I try, but you know, I but I do have that kind of thinking. So it's it's a great game to play with yourself. And you'll be surprised. Like if you try really hard, and sometimes you feel like the words you don't want to let it go. It's like your baby, you don't want to let it go. But let it go. Let it go, then reread it next time you find that actually is a better way of writing. Right? And and you, at the end of the, at the end of the day, as a reader, you all know. What piece will really grab you? If you see like a five pages, you probably know you're not going to finish it, right? So you're trying to write as, as compactly as possible. It's not easy at all, particularly when I try to write having tell story style. That's what I like to do. I don't mean to write cryptically, you know, sort of unrecognized. So, but to write as a story, but as short as possible. Every sentence, it's actually a great, great game to play with yourself. I agree, and I will just uh, make one little note of a story that I know that reinforces this point, which is that uh, when I was an undergraduate, I took uh, a, n a number of painting classes. Um, and the teacher used to come around, and it was mostly painting things like apples or eggs or something like that. And she would say, oh, what's your favorite thing that you've done in this painting? And you would say, well, I think I really caught that shadow or something. And she would say, paint over it. <laughs> and it took me a long time to realize what she was doing. And then uh, I finally realized that she wanted to say, I'm, as a teacher, I'm not just asking for what you already know you can do. I'm asking for what you don't know you can do. Mm -hmm. And I want something new from you. And this is, this is not about, you know, we all know you have skills, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I want to get something out of you that, that is coming out of a place of such self-trust that you can destroy the evidence of it and then do it again better. Yeah. That's great. Um, so that relates, I think, powerfully to this one of my favorite pieces, uh, Rejection Pursuit. One of the reasons I like Rejection Pursuit so much is it sounds like you're pursuing rejection actively and that so hence the humor of the title. Um, By and, the way, that yeah. for statisticians, you may get it, that is, there's a pawn to it. Uh, right. There is a statistical method called the projection pursuit. Ah. So when I initially <laughs> actually wrote that rejection, of my, so you see, I, I try to, waving those mm -hmm. things in, it's just like an inside joke, you know. Yeah. yeah. And when I initially write the title, actually the editor, who is not who was not a statistician, she actually changed to something else. And I told her, don't, because there is an inside joke that a statistician would appreciate. So that's So I want to talk a little bit about the content of this piece um, as it relates to the way this is structured. One of the uh, most striking things about um, this piece is its use of humor. And do we all know what the root of humor is? Does anyone know what the root of humor is? Um, so basically, hume is from humus, which means earth. And so when you say that someone is down to earth, you're off, often because they have a capacity for humor. So the H-U-M. And it's the same humus that the humanities come out of and human comes out of. Um, and it's related to the ancient idea that we find cross-culturally that human beings are made out of dust. <laughs> I see. So humor means you know you're made of dust. It's okay. Don't take yourself too yeah, seriously. Yeah, exactly. Don't take yourself too seriously. But there is actually a theoretical underpinning to even something as simple as that. So I feel like this story about pursuing rejection is a story about acquiring a sense of humor about yourself as a scholar, but also learning how to take scholarship seriously by 
learning that you can laugh at yourself along the way. Would you say that's here? Well, yeah. actually, when you're dealing with a re re rejection, by yeah. the way, every one of you, yeah. if you haven't experienced any rejections, which I don't believe, but if you haven't <laughs> any rejections, with probably the one I can tell you, you will be experiencing at some time in your life. That's just the fact of life. And knowing how to handle it, sort of this humorous part is in, in a way is like, you know, if you can really have a little bit humor with yourself, that goes a long way, goes a long way to deal with these very difficult moments, right? Um, for some of you will become a professor, okay? For those of you, or even before you become professor, you will be writing research papers. You'll be submitting to the journals. And uh, the first time you're submitting is an incredible experience, okay? The first time you get the rejection is an incredible <laughs> experience. <laughs> Seriously, because how much work do you, you put in, right? You, we know how much work we are putting. It's like, it's like this, is, this is almost not just a paper. This is a sort of uh, an evidence of your worthiness, right? You get rejected, you know? <laughs> and, and so I really wanted my, I, no, I went through all these, so actually um, I went through you know, multiple times, but this story I told here was probably the most humiliating stories in my rejection pursuit, um, that you know, the paper was rejected by every major statistical journals you can think of, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, but no, now it's great. Now I, you know, give me a whole story to tell. I actually designed a whole course out of this with my uh, other colleague, Joe Blisting. We actually did a whole course. What I did was literally take these multiple copies. For some reason, I kept every single correspondence with the journal and every, re every sort of marked the pieces. So I put everything together. I should have brought it. Oh, yeah. But uh, together as a whole case study, I give to my students, say, analyze for me why I was not effective. Mm -hmm. How did I got to reject every time? In the end, this become, I hope I can say this, become a great paper in the following sense. I got actually unsolicited uh, email from a professor in Canada who wrote to me, said, you know, I normally only, I don't even know this professor, he said, I normally only read newspapers, novels on my train commute, but I read your paper. You know, for me, I said, wow. But he did not know this took me 10 years time. <laughs> goes, through, goes through this whole part. So part of the reason I wrote, I wrote this is want to share the story. I want to tell everyone, particularly students, like you say, it's entirely okay to be rejected. Okay, you know, many people will say, wow, you know, you're, you know, you're the big professor, you're the dean. Well, you know, we all we have this rejection being re rejected experience. Harvard is really good at that. The uh, Bureau of Study, they actually have this, um, this whole panels. I served on the panels, talk about this experience, these rejection panels. I even wrote a statistical theory of rejection you can find on my website. <laughs> what is the chance you will be rejected? I basically trying to really, you know, not just trying to do sort of humorous for the, for the sake of humorous, it's really to tell people that um, there much you can gain from the rejection. Now, not that you, you want to purposely get rejected in order to experience that. You don't need that because rejection comes very naturally, okay? <laughs> but when it comes, there are really very different ways of dealing with it. And whatever I tell you about this rejection, I don't expect this gonna avoid you being rejected. But I do expect that it will make a difference that next time you get rejected, you will not experience that hardship as much as I experienced. So sort of shortening that you know, learning, learning period. So that was sort of pretty much what I, you know, what I, trying, to, uh, you know, what I trying to convey. But I did have a, a more serious message, which I think you probably see toward the end. I find quite a bit of rejection that we experience is really our own fault. In a sense, we were trying to rush. I have been a referee review, associate editor, editors, I will find people, you know, submit a paper without doing the final reading. You will see clear typos, like there's no space between two words. Or there is a latex command left in, in, in the paper. Just like that kind of one tiny bit of error, you know what's going to happen for the, ref, the, the referee? Most referees are very busy. Referee looks very quickly. If they see things like that, they will, their attitude is, 
Well, if the author didn't take this seriously, why should I? They would just put it aside. Okay. So I would just, you know, I've seen too many times that, you know, how in the academic world everybody's rush, want to publish things. It's just too much rush that leads to things like, oh, they did not do the homework. They, they should have cited some author's work. They didn't. And you know, guess what? That author is a referee. It's very likely. OK, the author will say, well, this, they could easily write a comment and say, the author clearly did not know the literature. Therefore, a rejection. Right? So I've seen too many times this. So my theme, I think there was a table go, go with this paper. Mm -hmm. It's like every, I call it seven thing, things yes. about uh, rejection. Every one of them, my start first lines, take your time. Take your time.